All right, that was absolutely terrific. So one of the most amazing things that has happened in the last three decades is what happened after Donald Trump was elected president. And that was a candidate for president who made a lot of promises to bring power back to the people, to rein in the EPA and other government agencies, to drain the swamp. And he then proceeded to drain the swamp, to actually keep his promises. And he named a transition team of people that many of us knew and recognized and respected. Uh, it was an astonishing thing. And especially in the area of EPA, he named a gentleman named Myron E. Bell as chairman of his transition team. Uh, most of the people in this room probably know Myron E. Bell. All right? Uh, we, have, we have all met him over the years. He has spoken at countless conferences. He is a scholar. Uh, he is an activist. He is a networker. He's a public speaker. Uh, he's just a wonderful, committed guy who has been in this debate forever. And when Trump got elected, I think many of us wondered, okay, who's he going to put in charge? And we we're all prepared for disappointment. It's going to be some career bureaucrat. It's going to be some former governor. It's going to be some senator. And they're going to let us down. They're not going to take a real ax to the EPA. And instead, he names Myron e. Bell. And I think all of us, our hearts just lifted. You could probably hear it from coast to coast, the sound, of, the sound of us all celebrating in front of our TV sets, saying, yes, this is probably the most promising thing I've seen in years. The more even amazing thing is offered power, Myron e. Bell walked away from it. So is Myron e. Bell in the EPA today? No, he's not. He's back at CEI. So I think it was... John Adams, I can't remember, I was trying to find it on my phone. John Adams said the only people who can be trusted with power are people who don't want it. Okay? And here we have a man who was offered, I suppose, was offered considerable power, and he turned it down. So who is Myron e. Bell? He's a climate criminal, according to Greenpeace. All right? He's a leading misleader, according to Rolling Stone. He's a villain of the month, according to the Air, Clean Air Trust. Uh, we know him as the Director of Energy and Global Warming Policy at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He's also the Director of Freedom Action, which is a web-based grassroots activist organization, and he chairs the Cooler Heads Coalition, which is over two, uh, two dozen nonprofit organizations, including the Heartland Institute, that get together and coordinate our efforts on climate change issues. He chaired the EPA transition team for the Trump administration. He, as I understand it, has returned to CEI. I think he's going to be able to tell us just what he did and what's going on at EPA today. And it is our pleasure to be able to give him an award in recognition of a, a long career of service uh, to this great cause. It's the Speak Truth to Power Award. And I can't think of anybody who deserves it more than Myron E. Bell. Myron, come on up. Uh, thank you, Joe Bast and the Heartland Institute. I'm honored and humbled by this award. I, I would say, uh, Joe sort of hit the nail on the head, it's, uh, it's not speaking truth to power, it's, uh, it's persistence. Uh, and, and I think uh, many people in the room have been at this for a long time. And I think this award uh, sort of signifies uh, that CEI has been involved in this debate since the very beginning, like Heartland, like Fred Singer, like CFACT, and like several of you in the room. Uh, I think Fred Smith was actually one of three free market opponents who was at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 opposing the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So uh, I take this as really an award for CEI. Uh, Two of my colleagues, Marlo Lewis and Chris Horner, are here tonight who've been at this almost as long as I have. Well, Marlo's been at it longer than I have. Um, I want to say a, a little bit about speaking truth to power, uh, but I, I'll say a little bit about 
uh, what I think is going on first. Well, let me say about speaking truth to power, I think it's really overrated. Uh, uh, first, um, first, there's the power side. Uh, the, the powerful don't really want to hear the truth, and so they don't listen. And then on the, the, tr the speaking truth side, well, everybody thinks that they're speaking the truth. And in fact, that phrase, speaking truth to power, is, of course, a left-wing phrase. I think the Quakers in 1955 were the first to use it publicly, promoting pacifism at the height of the Cold War. So we all think we're speaking truth to power. Uh, I was on, uh, I couldn't attend the first couple sessions this morning because I was on a Skype to the Economist Sustainability Summit, the Economist magazine in London. I was on Skype and John Podesta was there in person. And it, it just conveniently happened that my Skype connection was cut off just when I was making you know, the most important point and John Podesta immediately broke in and said, well, he's the kind of, he's the guy who over decades has persisted by denying the facts. He is impervious to the facts. So John Podesta thinks he has the truth, and I think I have the truth. And you, we all more or less agree, and I, that always kind of worries me when everybody gets together and agrees. What I would say is how I came to where I am on climate science is uh, when I first started seeing climate scientists and economists talk about things, the skeptics were open to argument they were open to facts, and they didn't predict the future. I get very, I think, you know, the problem with the expertariat that runs our country now, or would like, wants to run, or continue to run our country, is that they can see the future. They know, they know exactly what's going to happen, and they know the ideal policies, the, the perfect economic setup that will get you what you want. Now, I think we heard from Roger Helmer's great speech that, in fact, those policies, once they enter the political realm, no matter how good they sound in theory, are always made as inefficient and, in many cases, as criminal as possible. So what we have now as the result of this expertariat that has been driving global warming policy since the early 1990s is a climate industrial complex that is sucking our economy dry for no benefit. And so, so I think speaking truth to power is important, but I think we shouldn't get too wound up in how we have the truth. I think a certain modesty is, is appropriate. And uh, I think if you find yourself predicting what the future holds, you should think about the Hubbard peak Peak oil. King Hubbard was, in fact, ac absolutely right about peak oil. He predicted it to the year in the United States. But it never occurred to him that there was a completely different resource called shale oil and gas that would boost production uh, way beyond conventional production. In a few years, the United States will be the world's energy superpower because of the shale oil and gas revolution. So King, King Hubbard was right when he predicted that peak, but he didn't see the whole picture. He didn't see that, that human beings, as Julian Simon said, have a brain that can find new resources. In fact, these, these so-called limited resources, non-renewable resources, are in fact limitless for all practical purposes. So, um, I, I, Joe said I should say something about where I think we are politically, uh, since I, I, I did have the honor of uh, leading uh, President-elect Trump's uh, transition team from uh, early September to January 19th. And some very important people in the transition are here tonight, Becky Norton Dunlop and her husband George, for example, who are, played very key roles. I was just down at a low little agency. But President Trump has practical experience of environmental regulations. As a builder and developer, he has come up against what what the EPA and what other agencies can do to stymie investment in the economy. He has practical experience of it. And I think that's why he's so good on it. I think that's why he sees that the EPA is the principal obstacle to renewing our resource and manufacturing industries. 
the people who voted for him, the people that he saw in the campaign, and he was the only candidate who wasn't packaged. And I, I wasn't a supporter, I didn't support him uh, until he was nominated. Uh, but he learned something, and I, I learned this about him in looking, at, looking back over the campaign. All the other candidates were packaged. He went around the country, and at these rallies, he would actually sit down and talk to people. And what he found out is that the bicoastal urban elite and the expertariat and the financial industry and Silicon Valley and Hollywood have benefited economically from the policies for a long, long time, and the people who make stuff, dig up stuff, and grow stuff for a living are forgotten. The policies of the Obama administration were actually to do them down, and they, ha they have had it, and that is why they elected Donald Trump, because the Bush establishment gave them nothing, right? They, they, they talked the talk, but the, the actual policy was benign neglect. So I think President uh, Trump was elected because he actually got it about what makes the heartland of America run, the people who make stuff, grow stuff, and dig up st stuff for a living. So I'm extremely hopeful that he is going to keep his campaign promises. He is going to withdraw the United States from the Paris Climate Treaty. He is going to take out and, and rip up all of these uh, EPA rules, and he is going to cut the EPA back down to an agency that actually uh, is, is charged with protecting the environment for the American people and not trying to take over the country. So thank you.